Um, and do we want to first go over the uh, uh, exhibits that you're seeking to admit? Uh, yes, Your Honor. Um, last night, uh, we provided defense counsel a list of all the exhibits that were admitted in this case. Um, we've had an opportunity to review uh, the list with them. They had some questions about some of the paper exhibits that were discussed by witnesses but weren't necessarily um, published. Um, and it's my understanding the defense, um, having reviewed the list and the exhibits that they had questions about, that it had no objection to the exhibits that we're seeking to admit in this case. That's correct, Your Honor. There's no objection. Does, do I have a witness list? I got this, the state's exhibit list. Is that the, what we have? Yeah. Yes, Your Honor. Correct. So uh, the, the exhibits to be admitted would be one, the ID photo of Casey. Uh, 2A through Z, uh, 2A, A, B, B, C, D, E, E are not going to be admitted, is that correct? No, uh, the 2A, A, B, B, C, C, D, E, those are. Your Honor, maybe, maybe may I suggest that maybe uh, Mr. Mr. Shaw read each one and then. Yeah. Well, but. Do you, do you want me to read the descriptions too then? Sure. That's fine. Okay. Um, so State's Exhibit 1 is an ID photo of Casey, 2A spent shell casing, CSSU item number 1, 2B spent shell casing. <laughs> you, you want a copy of the list? Okay. Spent shell casing, CSSU item number 2, and again that's 2B. 2C spent shell casing, CSSU item number 3, 2D spent shell casing, CSSU item number 4, 2E. Spent shell casing CSSU item number five, two F. Spent shell casing CSSU item number six, two F or two G. Smith and Wesson handgun, two H. Smith and Wesson clip, two I. Bullets from Smith and Wesson clip, two J. Test firings from Smith and Wesson, two K. Spent projectile CSSU item number ten. 2N, spent projectile CSSU item number 13. 2O, spent projectile CSSU item number 14. 2P, CSSU photo of street sign number LG002. 2Q, CSSU photo of front of house LLG0003. 2R, CSSU photo of house address LLG0004. 2S, CSSU photo of position of vehicles. LLG0009, 2T, CSSU, photo front view of Goodson vehicle, LLG0010, 2U, CSSU, photo of left side view of Goodson vehicle, LLG0011, 2B, CSSU, photo of rear view of left side of Goodson vehicle, LLG0012, 2W, CSSU, photo of rear view of Goodson vehicle, LLG0013, 2X, CSSU, photo of rear view of right side of Goodson vehicle, LLG 0014. 2Y, CSSU, photo of right side view of Goodson vehicle, LLG 0015. 2Z, CSSU, photo of front view of Mead vehicle, LLG 0016. 2AA, CSSU, photo of left side. I didn't think you're seeking to admit 2AA. 2AA, yes. You are seeking to admit? Yes. Yes, Your Honor. Why isn't it checked? Um, if you're looking at a checklist, I think that may have been one provided by the defense. Um, oh, I, I'm just, there's no checks on these, but so. Yeah, we, um, we had uh, our work product list, and what we did is we called that down and generated the list that was shared with the court. All right, um, go, I mean. Um, so, uh, Again, 2AA, we're seeking to admit, CSSU, photo of left side view of Mead vehicle, LLG 0017, 2BB, CSSU, photo of rear view of left side of Mead vehicle, LLG 0018, 2CC, CSSU, photo of rear view of Mead vehicle, LLG 0019, 2DD, CSSU, photo of rear view of right side of Mead vehicle, LLG 0020, 2EE, CSSU, photo of right side of Mead vehicle, LLG 0021. 2FF, CSSU, photo of south side view of 3996 Estates Place, LLG 0022. 2GG, CSSU, photo of view of side yard of 3996 Estates Place, LLG 0023. 
two HH CSSU photo of view of fence and shell casings LLGO two four two II CSSU photo of view of shell casing number one LLGO two five two JJ CSSU photo of view of shell casing number two LLGO two six two KK CSSU photo of view of shell casing number three LLGO two seven two LL CSSU photo of view of shell casing number four LLGO two eight 2MM, CSSU photo view of shell casing number 5, LLG 029. 2NN, CSSU photo view of shell casing number 6, LLG 033. Uh, for the record, we're going to be continuing with these photos. They, the prefix of all of them is CSSU, so I'm, if it would be okay, I'm going to omit that to kind of. Yeah. Um, the whole batch. Uh, 200, photo of view of side porch and storm door, LLG 033. 2PP, photo of view of side stoop and glass fragments, LLG 036. 2QQ, photo of glass fragments outside of side door, LLG 039. 2RR, photo of view of outside of storm door, LLG 040. 2SS, photo of view of outside of storm door screen, LLG 041. 2TT, photo of view of side door threshold, LLG0042. 2UU, L, photo closer view of side door threshold, LLG0043. 2VV, photo of view of north and east sides of the kitchen, LLG0044. 2WW, photo of view of south side entrance to kitchen and partial view of west wall of kitchen, LLG0045. 2XX, photo of view of side door and south side from inside the kitchen, LLG0046. 2YY, photo of view of kitchen table and southeast corner of kitchen, LLG0047. 2ZZ, photo of view of side door from, of kitchen floor looking northeast, LLG0048. 2AAA, photo of view of kitchen floor looking south, LLG0049. 2BBB, photo of view of microwave, LLG0050. 2CCC, photo of view of item number 9, goods and handgun, LLG0051. 2 triple D, photo of view of item number 10, spent projectile on floor, LLG0052. 2 triple E, photo of view of air pods and item number 11, do rag on the floor of kitchen, LLG0053. 2 triple F, photo of view of item number 12, goods and mask on floor of kitchen, LLG0054. 2 triple G, photo of view of close up of microwave or meat bullet recovered, LLG0055. 2 triple H, photo of second view of close up of microwave where meat bullet recovered, LLG 0056. 2 triple I, photo of view of floor in front of stove and kitchen, LLG 0057. 2.01 triple I, photo of close up view of water bucket and edge of su subway bag. 2 triple J, um, and for the record, the 2.01 triple I, or I'm sorry, that, that was a CSSU photo. Um, so again, that, the last one I read was the 2.01 triple I. And then the next one is 2 triple J, photo of view of south entrance to kitchen, LLG0058. 2 triple K, photo of view of south entrance to kitchen and doorway to second bedroom, LLG0059. 2 triple L, photo of view of living room looking southwest, LLG0097. 2 triple M, photo of view of living room looking southeast, LLG0098. 2 um, triple N, photo of view of living room front door, LLG0099. 2 triple O, photo of view of living room doorway to bedroom hallway, LLG0100. 2 triple P, photo of view of inside side door with keys and lock, LLG0101. 2 triple Q, photo of soffit over sink in the kitchen, LLG0137. 2 triple R, photo of view of bullet strike over the sink in the kitchen. LLG 0138, 2 triple S, photo of view of embedded projectile above sink and kitchen, LLG 0140, 2 triple T, photo of view of soffit after removal of drywall, LLG 0141, 2 triple U, photo of second view of soffit after removal of drywall, LLG 0142, 2 triple V, photo close up of keys and door from 2 dash PP, that was 2 triple V. Uh, 2 triple W, CPD, recovered firearm form for goods and handgun. That does not have the prefix CSSU. 2 triple X, CSSU sketch of shooting scene. Um, so for now, I'm done with the CSSU prefixes. Um, and now we're on to States Exhibit 3A, Daniel Defense, uh, Dom 
for rifle, serial number DDM 4183712, item number one. 3B, Daniel Defense Rifle Magazine, item number two. 3C, 23 rounds of ammunition from Daniel Defense Rifle Magazine, item number three. 3D, test firings from Daniel Defense Dom 4 Rifle. 3E, CPD recovered firearm form, 3F, and now we're doing CSSU again, so all of the following exhibits have a CSSU prefix in the name, or description rather. So it's 3G, photo of Deputy Meade with placard on back of vest, JES 0004, 3H, photo of Daniel Defense Rifle, JES 0006, 3I, photo of Daniel Defense Rifle serial number, JES 0007, 3J, photo of Daniel Defense Rifle with magazine and ammunition out, JES 0008. 3K, photo of magazine and ammunition. 3L, photo of ammunition. 5A, and no more CSSU prefixes now. So 5A is Goodson's hoodie. 5B, Goodson's pants, socks, and boxer shorts. 5C, Goodson's gym shorts. 5D, Goodson's shirt. 5E, Sharon Payne's debit card. 5F, Goodson's iPhone. 5G, Goodson's cloth holster. 5H, Goodson's wallet with CCW, CDL, and GAP ID. And within that exhibit, there's exhibit 5HH, uh, Goodson's CCW license, 5A, 5I, Janae Sanford's iPod case, 5J, uh, and now we have CSSU prefixes again with the descriptions beginning with 5J. 5J, photo of front of Goodson hoodie, hoodie with a uh, yellow arrow. 5K, photo of front of Goodson hoodie with yellow arrow highlighting hole. 5L, photo of front of Goodson hoodie with close up of hole and scale. 5M, photo of back of Goodson hoodie. 5N, photo of backs of back of Goodson hoodie with holes highlighted and scale. 5O, photo of back of Goodson boxers with holes highlighted. 5P, photo of front of Goodson t-shirt with holes highlighted. 5Q, photo of back of Goodson t-shirt with highlights. 5R, photo of holes in back of Goodson's t-shirt. Top grouping highlighted with scale. 5S, photo of holes in back of Goodson's t-shirt. Middle grouping highlighted with scale. 5T, photo of holes in back of Goodson t-shirt, bottom group, grouping highlighted with scale. 5U, photo of front of Goodson gym shorts. 5V, photo of back of Goodson gym shorts. 5W, photo of back of Goodson gym shorts with right facing hole highlighted. 5X, photo of back of Goodson gym shorts with left facing hole highlighted. 5Y, photo of front of Goodson jeans. 5Z, photo of back of Goodson jeans. 5AA, photo of back of Goodson jeans top view. 5BB, photo of Goodson cloth holster clip side. 5CC, photo of Goodson cloth holster non clip side. 5DD, photo of Goodson wallet plus content with pocket contents. 6A, no more CSSU prefixes for these descriptions now. So 6A is projectile from chest. 6B, projectile from abdomen. 6C, fragment from left get leg. 6D, fragment from back. 6E, fragment from left up chest. 6F, fragment from pleural cavity. 6G, Fragment from right pelvis, 6H, fragment from left upper <coughs> chest, 6I, fragment from lateral chest, 6J, coroner's diagram number one, 6K, coroner's diagram number two, 6M, coroner photo body bag tag unique to Goodson autopsy, DSC 0002, 6N, coroner photo showing medical intervention, DSC 0057, 6O, coroner photo showing interior or front view of GSWs, DSC 0102, 6P, coroner photo showing posterior back view of GSWs, DSC 0148. 6Q, coroner photo showing close-up of bullet under skin, DSC 0092. 7, AirPods, 7G, still from Ernest's video of subway bag showing position relative to stove. 7H, still from Ernest's video showing close-up of subway bag with sandwiches. 8, BWC of Sam Rippey. 8A, still from Sam Rippey, BWC of Casey on kitchen floor. 8B, still from Rippy BWC of Barnhart, working on Casey, AirPod and left ear. 8C, still from Rippy BWC of AirPod and left ear. 8CC, still from Rippy BWC of AirPod and left ear. 8D, still from Rippy BWC of Subway Bag with Medics Takeover. 8E, still from Rippy BWC of Subway Bag, showing bucket and logo on bag. 8F, still from Rippy BWC of Subway Bag, showing bucket and logo on bag. 9, BWC of Sub Penny. 9A, snippet of statement on porch from BWC Penny. And in particular, we clarified and confirmed with the defense that this is not the uh, alternative uh, portion of the BWC footage of Penny that there was a discussion on yesterday. Um, 10, trajectory diagram. 10A, FBI photo of storm door full view with rods in it. 10B, FBI photo of storm door with rods, closer view. 10C, FBI photo of ripped door with rods and charrette. 
um, rods and trajectory, 10D, FDI, FBI photo of kitchen soffit with two holes and one impact, 10E, FBI photo of close-up of hole 7, 10F, FBI photo of close-up of hole 6, 12, ATF firearms trace summary certified copy, 13A, snippet of intersection, 13B, snippet of estates, uh, 14, photo inside subway, 14B, subway receipt, 15, Saraga International parking lot still shot, 17, Google affidavit and list of records received, 18, 911 call, 20, snippet of door closing video, 25, diagram with Sharon's notes, 25A, diagram with Janae's notes, 25B, diagram with Ernest's notes, and 26, the door. And thus concludes the exhibits we're moving to admit, and then we also have stipulations of the parties. Uh, any uh, objections? Uh, all those, uh, uh, all those will be admitted. Thank you, Your Honor. Um, Your Honor, uh, we have we have stipulations to, to read to the jury, but with the exception of that, we, we have no further evidence to offer. Okay, well, I'll let you rest in front of the jury um, uh, after you read the. Exhibits, any motions on behalf of the uh, defense? Thank you, Your Honor. Um, we're asking that the court grant our motion for judgment of acquittal pursuant to criminal rule 29. As this court is aware, the standard to which uh, a court can grant a motion pursuant to rule 29 is that reasonable minds cannot reach different conclusions as to whether each material element of a crime has been proved beyond a reasonable doubt, even when viewed in the light most favorable to the state. The material elements here at issue, Judge, are the mental elements associated with each charge. First and foremost, Your Honor, the state of Ohio chose to indict our client under three different competing theories, purposeful murder, felony murder, and reckless homicide. The state of Ohio rested its case in chief and did not produce a scintilla of proof, Your Honor, with respect to the mental elements associated with either one of these charges. Nobody, Your Honor, took the stand and told you that our client acted with heedless indifference. And so I'd like to start, Your Honor, with the reckless homicide charge. There's a reason, Your Honor, why reckless murder is not a lesser included charge of felony murder. And that's because reckless homicide has an element that felony murder lacks, recklessness with regard to the death of the victim. Nobody throughout the course of this trial, Your Honor, has taken the stand to say that they observed Mr. Meade act with heedless indifference when he made the decision to shoot on December 4th, 2020. Nobody took the stand, Your Honor, and even said that they saw Jason Meade act recklessly before the shooting. With respect to the purposeful murder charge, Your Honor, in the court's own jury instructions that it provided the parties with, which is modeled on OJI, a person acts purposefully when it is his specific intention to cause a certain result, aka death. Judge, every single law enforcement officer who took the stand throughout the state's case in chief told you the exact opposite. Officer Rippey, Detective Williams, Detective Croom. Every single law enforcement officer, Your Honor, who took that the state put up there um, it, it, to testify before this court stated that when a police officer shoots based on his training, it is their specific intention to stop the deadly threat, not to kill, Your Honor. And the state had an opportunity to produce that type of evidence that it is their specific intention to kill. However, Judge, they did not. With respect to the felony murder charge, Your Honor, yet again, the state has not produced any type of evidence concerning the mental element associated with the predicate offense of felonious assault. As such, Your Honor, we're asking that you grant our motion for uh, Rule 29 um, because no reasonable, or because reasonable minds cannot reach different conclusions as to whether each material element of the crime has been proven beyond a reasonable doubt with that specific reference, Your Honor, being to the mental elements associated with the charges at play here. Thank you, Your Honor. Any response? Thank you, Your Honor. With all due respect to Ms. Stevenson, um, the mental element can, can arise out of the facts and circumstances that are presented in the case. Six shots in the back, Your Honor. If that's not purpose to kill, I don't know what is. As the court knows, in the jury instructions, when you point a, a firearm at someone, there is a presumption of, an, uh, of purpose to kill. Reckless homicide, or re reckless uh, is a lesser to purposeful, 
certainly, if, if not purposeful, there's heedless indifference. Colonial assault is based upon knowingly when you point a gun and fire it at, at, at someone and, and cause serious physical harm. That's the offense of felonious assault. Uh, if that causes their death, which certainly did, uh, then all the elements are met. I'd ask you to deny their motion. At this time, I'll deny the uh, Rule 29 motion. Um, and do we need to put anything on the record prior to bringing in the jury? I don't believe so. No, not on behalf of Mr. Meeks. Um, do you need some time to get your uh, witnesses and all that? I, or you I believe there, I believe so. Okay, okay. I just want to know whether they rest and we take a break and then you set up or. All right, I think we can roll right into it. All right, perfect. Let's go to the jury. Are you wanting us to read the exhibits to the jury again or? The stipulations. Well, we're going to read the stipulations, but I, I thought I thought you had said something about the. Exhibit. I'm not going to do that again. <laughs> <laughs> no, no. They get all the stuff. That, that's what we were hoping for. Yeah. And the uh, the other thing is, I'm not going to give them the ammunition with the firearm. If they request, if they want to see the firearm, I'll have the sheriffs take the, the firearm back to them without any of the ammunition. And um, so that's. No, I, I, we, we have no problem with keeping that separate. John, you just go run down the hall just real quick. Right there. All right. All right. Yeah. Thank you. What? Have a seat. Everyone have a good evening last night? Good, good, good. Uh, any further are any stipulations up by the parties? Yes, your honor. <coughs> A series of 
stipulations that I'll read at this time. The first stipulation, Your Honor, is that a stipulation concerning the firearms trace summary of the Smith & Wesson M&P 45 serial number NCR 6066. Stipulation is as follows. The parties agree that this that states exhibit number 12 is a certified copy of the firearms trace summary done by the Bureau of Alcohol, Tobacco, Firearms and Explosives National Tracing Center for the Smith and Wesson MP45 pistol serial number NCR 6066. The second stipulation, Your Honor, is concerning transport of items collected by the coroner. The stipulation reads as follows. The parties agree that states exhibits numbers 6A through 6I, or I'm sorry, 6L, were transferred by a crime scene search unit detective to the Columbus Police Property Room on December 11th, 2020, and secured there under property number 20 P O one nine nine oh six the third stipulation your honor concerns st. Matthias videos and the stipulation reads as follows the parties agree that states exhibits numbers 13 a and 13 B are surveillance videos showing the intersection of Ferris Avenue and Carl Road and the intersection of Ferris Avenue and Estates Place on December 4th, 2020. The next stipulation, Your Honor, is a stipulation concerning uh, Saraga, well, here, yeah, the, the Saraga International video still. The parties agree that States Exhibit number 15 is a photo depict, depicting Casey Goodson Jr outside the Subway store located at 1251 Morse Road, Columbus, Ohio, 43228 on December 4th, 2020. Parties further agree that the timestamp on the photo is incorrect. The next stipulation, Your Honor, is a stipulation concerning a subway, concerning the subway video still. And the stipulation reads as follows. The parties agree that, this, that states exhibit number 14 is a photo depicting Casey Goodson Jr. as he left the Subway store located at 1251 Morris Road, Columbus, Ohio, 43228 on December 4th, 2020. And the final stipulation, Your Honor, is a stipulation concerning the Subway receipt the stipulation reads as follows. The parties agree that States Exhibit number 14A is a duplicate copy of a subway receipt showing the purchase made by Casey Goodson <clears throat> on December 4th, 2020. So, Your Honor, we are stipulating to those. We would ask, and don't do now at another time, that those get identified with an exhibit sticker by the same series, because I know we've already had a couple of stipulations right. read to the jury as well. I'm, I'm we'll give them to Jill, and she'll put a, a, a party's designation as to all the stipulations. <clears throat> With that, Your Honor, the state rests its case. OK. Uh, any um, any witnesses on behalf of the defense? Absolutely, Your Honor. We would like to present a, a case, and we would start with the reading of a stipulation with the court's permission. You may. Yeah, can we sidebar? Okay.
May I proceed, Your Honor? You may. Your Honor, I'm reading a uh, stipulation by the agreement of both parties that defendants exhibit Q, stipulation concerning Tamala Payne. The parties agree that on December 4th, 2020, at around 10.15 a.m., Tamala Payne called her son, Casey Goodson, who answered the phone, and the two of them had a conversation, during which she told her son to be careful because law enforcement had Graham's house and the whole neighborhood surrounded, and that Casey might want to tell his little friend the police were looking for someone in the apartments. So stipulated? We stipulated. Okay. All right. With that, Your Honor, we'll call our first witness. Okay, you may. You're going to go through this little maze around there, over there, and the judge will take you from there. Okay. It's a little maze, so you have to be walking around. stuff down on the table. Can you raise your right hand? Do you solemnly swear, firm under penalty of perjury, your testimony in this case will be the truth, the whole truth, nothing but the truth? Yes. Have a seat, pull yourself up close to the microphone. You can testify with or without a mask. You may inquire. Good morning. Please state your name for the record and spell your last name for the court reporter, please. Sheila Staniford, S-T-A-N-I-F-O-R-D. And Ms. Staniford, can you tell us where you lived on December the 4th of 2020? 4015 Estates Place, Columbus, Ohio, 43224. You still live there? No. How long ago did you move? Um, I'll be going on three years come this um, Thanksgiving like a little over two and a half. So you lived there about 11 months after December the 4th, 2000? Yeah, but prior to that, I lived there like 10 or 11 years. Okay. And can you tell us if you remember anything unusual happening on December the 4th of 2020? Well, prior, yes. I, I was going to a funeral, but I saw some cars out there. And I... Let's talk about the funeral oh. first. Uh, where was the funeral? Funeral was on 161 at the Newcomers. That was a funeral home? Yeah. And who'd you attend the funeral with? My husband. What's his name? Donnie Staniford. How long have you been married to Donnie? 
35 years. And is he currently employed? No, he's disabled. And what's his disability? Cancer. Is he suffering from cancer now? Yeah, he has stomach cancer. And so you went to a funeral with your husband, Donnie, and I think you said the funeral home was on 161, is that yeah, right? Yeah, it was a good friend of ours. His mom passed away. And did you go to the gravesite? No. Just calling hours? Yeah. What did you do after you finished going to the calling hours at the funeral home? We stopped at Walford Market to get some lottery. And then we... So usually, did you say Walford Market? Yeah. And where is that located? Right on Walford Street um, in between Sale and Ferris. How far is that from where you lived at the time? And that would be 4015 Estates Place. How long would it take you to get from Walford? In a car, maybe two minutes, three minutes. Okay. And you stopped there to get lottery tickets? Yeah. Did you go inside to get lottery tickets? I didn't. Donnie did. So I just who was driving? Donnie. Donnie was driving. So Donnie dropped you off. You went and got lottery tickets. Donnie went and got lottery. I just stayed in the car. Okay. So what happened after the lottery tickets were purchased? We were going down the street and um. What street? Case. Okay. Went down so Case. Intersect with Case. Yeah, you can turn off Walford's Case and go all the way down and it dead ends to by Estates Place. Well, I mean, you, there's apartments right there, but yeah, we drove down there and then we, we saw somebody outside there. That's when we approached, that's when things were going on. We, we didn't know who it was. We just heard when we had turned the corner to put his gun down. So if you're on case, what direction are you turning on to a state's place? Let it go. There's only one way you can go, right? Turn right? <laughs> And I lived two houses after that. And which side of the street is your, after you've made your right hand turn onto a stage place, which side of the street are you on? The left side. So you're, Donnie's driving. Mm -hmm. And what do you see as you're turning onto a stage place? We see someone, I just saw someone in the yard yelling at them. I didn't know it was a cop. I didn't, I didn't know who it was. All I heard was, put your gun down, put your gun down. And when I was like, Donnie, stop. Look what's going on. And Donnie's like, wait, we'll pull up to the driveway. You know, when we pulled there, that's when we heard the shots. So, and So if we can kind of stop and move back just a little bit. <laughs> um, so you turn on to a stage place, and do you see someone pursuing someone? Yeah. And did you know the person being pursued? Yeah. Who was that? Um, Casey. I don't know him personally, but I know of him. You know what I mean? I know that he lives there and his name. He was a neighbor and you're familiar? Yeah. Because his dog was used to come over in our yard. His dog. And we'd have to yell for him to get his dog. All right. So Casey was being pursued by another individual? Yes. And how was that individual dressed, if you remember? That was pursuing Casey. Honestly, I didn't. I didn't see it was so quick. You know, what I mean, it was. We were going in the car, and we were. It happened so fast. It just happened so fast. I honestly, I thought he was in tan. I don't know. I couldn't bet a hundred percent on it, but I do. Who I saw, and I saw Casey, but we didn't know what was going on because prior to that, when we heard that someone come running out the front door and said, Grandma, Grandma, I think Casey's been shot. So we thought, maybe, we didn't know what to think if it was a home invasion. You know what I mean? There was so much stuff going on. We didn't know. So was, I know that prior to that, though, a guy told Casey to put, his, put the gun down, put the gun down several times. So you heard someone say, put the gun down. Yeah. How many times did you hear that? At least two. Was that before or after the gunshots? That was before the gunshots. Did you see the shooting? No. Why didn't you see the shooting? Because Donnie was in a hurry to get in the driveway and see what was going on. He didn't, there was, he wanted to get home too. He's got cancer, you know what I mean? He had to take his meds. He, 
when it happened. We didn't know what was, like I said, we didn't know what was going on. He just, he heard that. And then Donnie's like, wait, let me pull my car up. And because we didn't know what was going on. Then the kid came out and it just all happened so fast. Are you inside the car or outside the car when you hear this person yelling, put your gun down, put your gun down? We were in the car and the window was down. I rolled the window down because I was smoking. And right when we turned the corner, that's when we heard it. And of course, we were scared. You know what I mean? I didn't know what to think. I don't. I didn't know what was going on. Like I said, and we just drove inside the driveway. And then when we drove in the driveway, that's when we heard the gunshots. And that's when I got more scared and I went inside the house. But after that, and then um. Did you ever get interviewed by a detective? Yeah. Prior to that, that's when Casey's brother came out and was yelling, "Grandma, I think." Casey's been shot. When did a detective uh, interview you? There were several people that came there. I don't know. They never, no one told me that they were taping me or anything. Okay. But did the interview happen at your house? Yeah. And was it close in time to yes. December 4th, 2020? Uh -huh. And do you remember how long the interview was? No. And have you heard a recording of that interview yes have you and i ever met no and the interview that you listened to was your voice on there yes and did that detective force you to say anything that you said during that interview no Thank you. you're welcome <coughs> hold on one other question, Ms. Stanford. <coughs> Have you ever uh, met with the prosecution team in this case? No, I've never. This first time meeting all you guys. Uh, Any cross examination? Uh, yes, sir. <coughs> now, Ms. Stanford, you you'd uh, you'd indicated you'd had some problems with. Uh, Casey's dog, is that right? I have no problems. He just came over to the yard. He's got a big dog. I got a little tiny teacup poodle. Okay, so you're saying on this uh, particular day, uh, you were coming back from the funeral and you were in the car. Is that right? Yes. Okay. And uh, the path you took was um, Case to Estates. Is that right? Making and from Walford to Case to Estates. Um, and so... When you make that turn onto uh, the states, that's when you're passing on the right-hand side would be uh, Sharon Payne's house, correct? I don't know Sharon Payne. I don't know her name, but you're house. talking about the corner house where all that stuff happened, yeah. And um, so when did you first see when you were making that turn, when did you start witnessing things? Right when we, right when we went by the house, we saw what was going on. We saw a guy in the... On the ground, yelling to put his gun down. Put his gun down. Saw a guy on the ground. I I don't know if he's on the ground or knelt down or whatever. I just heard him say that. And Casey was by the back door, Florida room or whatever you call that. By the Florida room. Yeah, it happened so fast. That's all I saw was like that. And so when you're talking about the Florida room, are you talking about the the portion of the house? Yeah, screen and porch or whatever. I don't know why I said Florida, but it's kind of like. Don't talk yeah. over each other. Let, let him ask. Okay, sorry. And you can answer. So you saw Casey up by the screen porch. Yes. Okay. Um, and that would be to the front of the house. Is that correct? That's to the front of the house. When you make the turn, the screen porch is in the front. No, it's not. It's on the, it's on the side. Okay. And you saw a screen porch. Yeah, there's no screen porch on the front. It's on the side, on his uh, case. Okay. The front of the house is on the states. I don't know if he's on the ground. I meant, I, when I saw him, I looked to the ground over there. They were, I heard him yell. I honestly can't say that he was on the ground. I don't know why. I just, it happened so fast, like I said. And isn't it true that your car was moving at the time? No, we slowed down. We slowed down there. How fast were you Probably five, ten miles an hour, if that. And so uh, then you proceeded onto your house? 
Yeah, Donnie went real fast after that to get into the driveway to see what's going on. Yeah, our driveway. I guess I don't. I, I know I talked to several people, so I, mm -hmm. whatever they asked me, I tried to answer to, yeah, for did, them. But you did speak to a Columbus police officer on December fourth, yeah. uh, correct? Yes. Okay. And isn't it true? In that interview, you told the, the officer that you had gone to the funeral and you had gotten back about eleven thirty. I don't know time wise. I never. I don't remember the time wise. Like I said, it's been a while. You told the detective that you'd gotten back to your house around 11.30. Isn't that true? I don't remember saying that. 11.30, if I did, if it's on tape, I guess I did, but I, I don't remember saying 11.30. Because okay. I don't even remember what time it was, all this stuff went on. And it isn't a true that uh, at that time you indicated that you were inside your home when you witnessed things. No. I taped things going on from my front window because I was scared to go out after the gunshots. And, isn't and I told him that I was taping them when Casey came out on the ambulance and stuff. I was taping the thing. I didn't tape him out of respect, but all the stuff that was going on. And that you became suspicious because there was a uh, heating and cooling truck that was sitting out in front of your home. Isn't that true? Sir. That was before everything happened. I was at my house and there was cars parked all down the street. I thought someone was going to try to break into my house. And I said to Donnie that, I said, why are all these cars parked on the street? After that, we left. We found out later on it was for what they were pursuing a guy that was two houses down from us. So it has nothing to do with that. I didn't see the shooting. I never once said I saw the shooting. I heard the guy tell him to put the gun down. If I played back the audio, would that refresh your recollection as to where you were when you told the officer? I know where I was. I know where I was. I mean, I don't know what you're talking about, 1130, but I know I was in the car. I know we pulled up in the driveway. And I was inside the house when I taped the rest of the stuff that was going on because I was scared to go outside. So to refresh your recollection, if I played the, the, the audio that you said that you got home at 11.30, would that refresh your recollection? If I said 11.30, I mean, I don't know what you're trying to get at what happened at 11.30. I just know what I saw. I don't know if I said 11.30. Maybe I was off on the time. I don't know. Um, ladies and gentlemen of the jury, we're going to uh, take a break. Um, uh, do not discuss this case among yourselves. Do not permit anyone to discuss it with you or in your presence. It is your duty not to form or express an opinion on the case until it is finally submitted to you. All right. It's going to be a short break. If you can stand. Okay. I'll just take a drink.
if you just want to ask your question, she doesn't know, then we'll just keep taking breaks.
eight times. And at that time, when, when did you when you listened to the tape? That was your voice on the tape. Yes, correct? yes, it was. And it was at that time, after listening to it, you did state to the detective that you did get home around eleven thirty. Around, yeah, I said around. And that's what you said to them back then. Yeah. Correct. And you were home, right? Try. I might have missed it. Might have got the times wrong. I don't know. I don't know what time it was actually. I'm just saying. I did say that on the tape, 11:30, around 11:30. I don't honestly. I don't know what time it was. So much happened. His mom passed away. You know, what I mean, everything was going on. And you said that there was a heating and cooling truck sitting in front of your house. Yeah, I remember now about the heating and cooling truck. There was a heating and cooling that was blocking. After we turned the corner. There was a heating and cooling kind of blocking that house there. You could still see at the corner there, but you, you couldn't see much. There was a heating and cooling. We didn't know who the heating and cooling was, truck, but there was a heating and cooling that had been you sitting stated, on there. You stated then, that's why I was looking out the window, correct? That was talking about prior. There was the heating and cooling there all day long. When I left, it was there. And when it came back, it was there. And then that's when you said, we saw the U.S. Marshal go there and we saw a black guy coming out. We did not, we didn't see the shooting. Isn't that correct? I did not see the shooting, no. I saw the U.S. Marshal, like I told you when he told him to put the gun down, put the gun down. Then I saw a black man come out the door saying, Grandma, I think they shot Casey. And then that's when you told the detective, when you were looking out the window, that we heard him yell. Correct. Talking about, I heard the young gentleman yell out the, coming out the door with a little girl or boy in his hands. Okay. And so today you are saying you do recall. You were looking out the window when you saw this. I saw out the, my car window him saying, put the gun down. The rest I saw out my front window. When I heard the gunshots, like I told you, I went inside my house, I was scared. You never told the detective that you drove by the scene, correct? Yes, I did. If it wasn't on there or whatever, I've talked, I told them that I, we drove down there. I told them we drove down Case, turned on right there on the streets. I have no reason to lie. I'm just telling you what I saw. I didn't see no shooting. All I heard was, no, put your gun down twice. Interrupt, and you can ask a question. Jill's gonna yell at me. <laughs> Did you say that that is why we were looking out the window? To what? To the to when you were describing what you saw. Yeah, I told you as soon as we got in the house. After we heard the gunshots, we saw out the window. That's why I had my video, which someone had stole my iPhone, that had everything going on on the iPhone that I was taping what was going on. Because we were too scared to go outside. So when you made your turn, what you're testifying to today, did you see a truck? We turned left on case, like I told you, there was a heating and cooling halfway on in front of that house and then onto the other house. There's the house on the corner and the house beside it. It was in between those two there. It was not blocking the hole where you couldn't see anything. I could still see Casey's house. It just. That's the only vehicle that you saw when you made your turn onto the stage. Well, there's more vehicles there. I don't, I didn't pay attention to every single one. That one was a reflection because it was right when we turned, it was right there. A heating and cooling. And it was there before that. Yeah, it was there before that. That's why I was wondering why they were sitting outside in front of my house the whole time. Because we were leaving and I was worried. And that. Heating and cooling truck was still there, correct? Yes. 
Any redirect? Ms. Staniford, is there any doubt in your mind that you heard that marshal yell, drop your gun, drop your gun, drop your gun? No, there's no doubt in my mind or I wouldn't be here. Is there any doubt in your mind that Overruled. that happened before the shooting? Objection. Overruled. I'm sorry. You can answer. Say that again, sorry. Is there any doubt in your mind that you heard those commands? Voice no, there's no the doubt in my mind. Before, before the shooting. That's an objection. Overruled. Hold on. I'm getting confused. I heard it. Okay. Hold on, hold on, hold on. Okay. <laughs> we have to I'm sorry. ask the question. I'll wait till he's done. Okay. We just wait to answer. Ask the question. So we've talked about what you heard. Drop your gun, drop your gun, drop your gun. Is there any doubt in your mind that those commands occurred before the shooting? So you heard those commands before you heard gunshots? Yes. Overruled, you can answer. I heard, that's exactly what I heard. All right, you can step down. All right, thank you. Take, take everything, you can take your water too. All right, thanks. Okay. Mr. Old, or do we have to do that at every witness? Well, Your Honor, actually, that would cover any of the, the three police officers who were deputized. Okay. So I don't think we need to repeat that. Yeah. I mean, it's a day less than here. We're all fully. Maze, you have to come around. You raise your right hand. Do you, do you solemnly swear or affirm under penalty of perjury your testimony in this case to be the truth, the whole truth, nothing but the truth? I do. Have a seat, pull yourself up close to the microphone. And you may inquire. 
Thank you. Uh, state your name for the record, please. Deputy U.S. Marshal David Younglis, Jr. Spell your last name for the court. Y-O-U-N-G-L-E-S-S. -S. Mr. Younglis, can you talk to us about what your education background is? <clears throat> I worked as a local law enforcement officer, put myself through the local police academy back in 2006, 2007. I uh, graduated in 2007. Was a local police officer up until I went to FLETC. Uh, my re actual retirement date with the Marshal Service started in August of 2011. Um, I became a Deputy U.S. Correction, August of 2010. I became a Deputy U.S. Marshal in July of 2011. All right. <clears throat> so you used an acronym FLETC, and I can tell you're a federal employee because of that. Can you tell the ladies and gentlemen, the jury, what FLETC stands for and what it is? It's the Federal Law Enforcement Training Center. Uh, most or a lot of the federal agencies, that's where they send their prospective uh, hirees to go through their police training. For us, <clears throat> there were two sides of the Fletzy campus, the CITP, which I believe stood for the Criminal uh, Investigative Training Program. And then once that was done, I, that was roughly three months on that side. And then the last month and a half of my training was on the Marshall side. Now the Marshall Service does the entire time down there, roughly four and a half months, completely on the Marshall side. So you don't get to act as a Deputy U.S. Marshal until you've completed FLETC, is that right? Correct. So you've graduated, right? Correct. And did you graduate? Yes, sir. Okay. And as far as... <clears throat> Some of the training that you uh, were exposed to at, at the FLETC uh, training center, um, did you become familiar with the use of force continuum? Yes, for the Marshal Service. And describe what a use of force continuum is. What, uh, what's your understanding of what it means? Essentially, it's whatever force is necessary to stop the threat at hand. And it's a continuum, so describe what the continuum is. <coughs> we don't have a continuum, if you will. It's you, you, pr you look at what your threat is or the problem at hand, and then you have to use reasonable force to stop that threat. Right. So what's presented to you is what you react to? Correct. Right. And what types of force are available if you are presented <coughs> with a threat? Uh, the there's only basically two types of force. There's less than lethal, for less than lethal force, and then there's deadly force. And give us examples of what uh, less than lethal force means. Uh, that could be fighting someone, wrestling with them. It could be using an expandable baton. It could be using uh, pepper spray or OC. Uh, could also be uh, using a taser. That's uh, less than lethal force. Okay. And when you were at Flexi, were you trained to treat everyone as a threat? Only those that presented a threat to us. They were Those were the ones treat our trained to be treated as a threat. And why are you trained that way? To be able to affect the rest, to be able to keep the public safe, to be able to keep ourselves safe. And while you're at Fletzy, were you trained in shoot, don't shoot scenarios? Yes. What, give us an example or paint the picture for the jury as far as. Overrule that's relevant. Paint the picture for the ladies and gentlemen of the jury, Deputy Young, this as far as what a shoot, don't shoot scenario is. One of our, <clears throat> we had multiple scenarios near the end of the Marshall side where we, at the end of the scenario, we had to write a use of force report. So not only were we graded on how we acted during the use of force, but was the force appropriate? And then secondly, or thirdly, we had to write the report on it also. Uh, there were many. One of them, uh, was a where there was no lethal force at that time needed. We were just talking to a guy that we had a, a, an arrest warrant for. It was a two-man team, which is normally not what we do, but for that trained, uh, boxed-in scenario, two people were more than enough to have this interview. <clears throat> during that, during our conversation, we went off the cues of the person we were trying to arrest on that warrant. If they were cooperative, we would just handcuff them, and that'd be the end of the day. There'd be no use of force needed to be written. If they weren't cooperative and we had to go hands-on and start wrestling and or fighting with them and no weapons were present, we would have what we felt was needed at that time, 
whether it be the baton, the OC, or the taser. Uh, even one of the scenarios, the guy we were talking to picked up a shovel as we started walking to him. So now at that point, he has a weapon in his hand and we had, would have to transition to deadly force. How quickly are you processing information when you're in these scenarios? Milliseconds. And so what type of information are you processing, Deputy Youngs? As all this is happening, we're, we're thinking, of, okay, what, what's happening here? What is this person or this fugitive doing at this point? What are their mannerisms? Are they blading their body? Are they screaming and yelling at us? Are they taking an aggressive posture, uh, raising their fists? Are they taking off their hat and their glasses because that's an indicator they're getting ready to fight? So we have to look at all these things, plus we have to keep in mind what's around us. Are we inside a house? Are we in a backyard? Are we doing a vehicle pin? What are the civilians around us? Is this a busy shopping mall? Is it a vacant parking lot that nobody's just in yet and we pin the vehicle in there? So we, we have, I don't want to say hundreds, but we, we have a lot of, of, of factors we have to consider in everything we do uh, when we do decide to use force if we need to use it. So your training at Flood Sea, mm -hmm. again, you're processing <clears throat> the person's actions and that will guide your reaction? Yes, sir. Yeah. Council, when I approach. of the questions uh, Hold on. Have, have the important person you ready oh, sorry <laughs> you uh, deputy youngless uh while you were at Pletsy, were you trained on the appropriate use of deadly force yes and quickly describe the circumstance under which you can use and you're authorized to use deadly force jackson overruled when the life of our life in general, or the, the life of a team member, or the life of uh, a civilian, a member of the public, is at great physical harm or uh, risk of death. And when that circumstance arises, are you trained to injure the person? No, we are trained to shoot center body, center mass. Purpose of that is the biggest part of the body is your, your core your center mass from you know just below your neck to your waist. Uh, in Hollywood, everyone would like us all to think you can shoot an arm and injure somebody, shoot a leg and they'll stop fighting. But the truth is that's just fake. Everybody has their own will to fight and their own desire to fight until they can't fight anymore. And when it's a deadly force situation, we shoot center mass because that is where the biggest part of the body is to hit. <clears throat> Deputy Youngless, uh, in your career at the U.S. Marshal Service, are you familiar with SOPAS? Yes, sir. What is SOPAS? The Southern Ohio Fugitive Apprehension Strike Team, we have four full-time teams throughout Southern Ohio. What's the primary goal of SOPAS? Uh, arrest fugitives and make sure everyone stays safe, not only in the community, but ourselves also. Which agency runs SOPAS? U.S. Marshal Service. And on December the 4th, did you have a leadership role on SOPAS? Yeah, I was the team leader of SOPAS during that time. And is SOFAST only comprised of Deputy U.S. Marshals? No, it's comprised of full-time and part-time TFOs. TFOs are task force officers. They're local police officers that the Marshal Service has an agreement with to work on our federal task force. 
Uh, we typically leave it up to the local agency if they want to put someone on full time, which means they come to work every day with us uh, at our office, our task force office, help work up cases, things like that. If an agency, local agency decides that they can't dedicate someone full time as a TFO to us, then they'll give us someone part time. And when I ran the team, it was they had a set day each part timer did that they would typically come out. And you said that you were team lead on December the 4th. Um, did the U.S. Marshal Service provide training to those task force officers that were members of SOFAS? Yeah, we have various trainings throughout the year. Uh, and then, of course, when COVID hit, that, that knocked down training quite a bit. But our typical trainings every year at a minimum are use of force, uh, breaching training with the RAM if we have to uh, force our way into a home shield training, entry training, which is what we would do once we get inside the home, how we get into the home. The shield training is our ballistic uh, shield, which could be a rifle rated shield or a pistol rated shield, among just various other trainings, vehicle takedowns. You know, how do we safely or attempt to safely execute pinning a vehicle or trapping it so it doesn't get away and we can arrest the fugitive inside? Talk about some of the equipment that uh, would be common to find with uh, so fast uh, task force officers. Ballistic vest, is that a common piece of equipment that TFOs would wear? Yeah, they their home agencies provide them their own, uh, most of their own equipment, which would be their vest, soft or, or um, rifle rated panels. Their firearms, of course, excuse me, uh, are provided by their local agencies. Um, we have our shields, ballistic shields. We have our rams, the Halligan tools. Full timers typically receive uh, government vehicle as a take home car because there are more ex more is expected out of them to be able to respond after hours versus a part time TFO. How about a radio? Yes. Uh, all the full time guys, it was easier to have them use their own agency radio and we would have our radio guy put our Marshall channels on their radio. For the part time guys that if they had similar radios, we would put our channels on their radios. It just makes more sense because everyone's going to always have their radio with them when they go to work. For the part timers that didn't have radios that could take our channels, I had a handful, uh, maybe six or ten. I forget the exact number of Marshall radios, if you will, that had our channels on them that any of the part-time guys could come in. They could just take one of those radios to be able to have comms that day. Is there anything unusual about the U.S. Marshall channel? Uh, it's not recorded by no means. Uh, that's a decision well above my pay grade. And is it something that every law enforcement officer has access to? No, we have to sign it a radio MOU with each respective agency that we put our channels on their radios for. So Columbus Police, Franklin County SWAT, Adult Parole Authority, uh, just some of the, uh, a few of the local agencies that we had uh, MOUs with, we would have a physical MOU from our radio guy to their department saying, you know, as long as they are a TFO, they can have this channel on their radio. Now you're talking like a government employee again. What's an MOU? A memorandum of understanding. And that would be an agreement by the U.S. Marshal Service and the agency that employs that TFO? Yes, sir. Okay. How about body-worn cameras? Um, at that point in time, the Marshal Service did not allow body-worn cameras. Again, it's a decision made at headquarters, well above my pay grade. <clears throat> they have since, they meaning the U.S. Marshal Service, has since um, started a body-worn camera program that multiple local agencies and even some deputy UF marshal districts are now trained in having those body cameras on and with them whenever they're doing operations. But on December the 4th, 2020, the U.S. Marshal Service did not allow TFOs or deputy U.S. Marshals to wear body-worn cameras? That is correct. So that decision isn't made by the, the team member, right? Correct. That's a decision solely at headquarters. Okay. And <coughs> I think that you said that uh, some individuals had uh, access to a, a full-time U.S. Marshal vehicle. Uh, did Mr. Mead, was he a full-time U.S. Marshal uh, task force member? Yeah, yes, he was. We had two at that time, but one of them took a promotion to sergeant at Franklin County, so we were down to uh, just Jay, and he had one of our uh, government-owned vehicles, which is also considered a GOV. Let's talk about December 4th. Uh, you were the team lead that day, right? Yes, sir. And 
tell the jury generally <clears throat> how a morning would start for SOCAS members? Uh, the day before we typically would start the planning process, <clears throat> I would look at my list of manpower, and that would be all my full-time guys plus my part-time guys. And if some, it would just depend on who's who I'm going to have that day, how many TFOs. Some of our full-time guys, like anyone else, they need a vacation, they take time off, they're sick, things like that, uh, myself included. So I would first look at our manpower and see what we have for manpower that day if we could run. So if this was Monday right now, and I plan on us running Tuesday, then I would look at my manpower for Tuesday. What do I have available? Who do I have? And do we have enough to run? I didn't like to run with less than six people, uh, depending upon what the case was. If it was a hotel room, I was comfortable with five people because it's one room, one door in, one way out. But typically I had at least six. I was very fortunate a lot of the times. Uh, you know, I would have upwards of eight plus guys on any given day, which is a real blessing because we have to do containment on whatever structure we're going to uh, be making an arrest attempt at on top of making entry into the residence. Um, but once the manpower is figured out, I would then look at what cases do we have based on a priority of what the case is. And when I say a case, I mean a warrant. We, as the marshal service, we do not affect anything without an arrest warrant unless it's exigent. We always have at our system at the time, uh, we, had a, we had a change over to a new system, but ultimately uh, capture is our system. Every case we work or every warrant we adopt, whether it's a federal warrant or a local warrant, we have to have it in our system called capture. And then once we enter all the information in the warrant, what the warrant is for, the date it was uh, issued, the agency issuing the warrant, we would get what's called a FID, a FID, which is a federal ID number. As the Marshal Service, we don't work a case without a FID. We don't do it at all. Um, we have to be able to have that FID. That's just policy. So then I would go through the cases. What, what do we have today? Is it a robbery? Do we have a murder, a warrant? Do we have um, a drug warrant? Just they're dependent on the warrant, and then I would rank them by priority, and then I would also rank them based on, on how we needed to get them arrested, how dangerous it's going to be, things like that. <clears throat> and so does the morning start with a briefing? Every case we do, um, <clears throat> for example, uh, if I had the first case we were going to do that day, I would have what I call packet put together. I'd have a copy of the warrant. I'd have our ops plan in it, multiple pictures, enough to at least hand a picture out to everybody for that day. I typically will have, for me, I'll put my uh, criminal history of the fugitive in there. I'll have our subject report, which lists the criminal history. and. I will brief the entire case to the team that day that is out. We'll have our meet location, whether it be at our office or we just finished a case or we have to meet somewhere else that's going to be a little bit of a drive away. We always stop and brief a case ahead of time. Go through that packet. Here's who I have. Here's what's alleged he did. Uh, here's who issued the warrant. This is the date it was issued on. Here's the criminal history. If there's a car in play, I uh, give that out also. Make sure everybody has a photo, of course. And then ask if anybody had any questions about anything, because sometimes you don't think of everything when you're briefing a case, and sometimes guys will bring up good questions. Uh, and you may forget to mention that they have a car that they always drive, and somebody will say, does he have a car? You know, sometimes it's the little things you forget as you're trying to remember the big things. Was this a procedure that you followed on December the 4th, 2020? Absolutely. And do you ever have add-ons to the list of <clears throat> fugitives that you're searching for? on the day that so fast team members meet? Yeah, it happens uh, quite a bit. It just depends on what's going on at that particular day. Uh, adult parole authority, uh, I, we, that happens a lot with them. I'll get a phone call from one of my APA TFOs says this guy just had a warrant issued or he's Val, um, Val, V-A-L. I forget what it means, I'm sorry. But basically, he, APA wants him arrested and um, I just forget what it means, I apologize. So they'll call during the day while we're already out running, or it may even be, it's a down day, it's an office day, and they'll call me and say, hey, can we go out and get this guy? We have a good address for him, this is where he's at. 
So at that point, I'll get them entered myself or my analyst or another TFO that has access to capture. We'll get them put in capture. We'll get that fid for them, and then I'll start getting bodies together in the process to see how many uh, how much manpower we have for that. Did you have any add-ons on December the 4th, 2020? I had two that day. What was the first one? The very first one, I actually got a phone call the night prior from my uh, Delaware County full-time TFO. <clears throat> they had a rape case, um, an uncle while his niece, give the details, okay. just if you can... it was a rape case that last night that came in late last night. He called me and asked if we had time for it. And I told him we have, we can't do it first thing because it wasn't entered in a capture yet. We needed to get the FID for it. So I told that TFO, when you get in the morning, start entering in, get me a FID. And then once you get it, we'll meet up and we'll hit that case. Um, I was told we had plenty of guys that day. It was not a big deal. I could afford to keep him back to get that in. That was the first add-on of the day. What was the second? The second was, uh, I can't think of the gentleman's name. I would need his name refreshed to me. But it was a Franklin County drug case. Uh, Jay Mead reached out to me uh, at some point prior to us being done and said SWAT guys were available. They could do containment for us. We'd be primary going in. And the drug guys, uh, the SIU, Special Investigative Unit for Franklin County, they reached out and was asking for help to hit this house. So I had uh, my analyst enter that case in. Jay emailed me everything. I sent it to my analyst. She entered everything in our system, got us a FID for it. And then once I got the FID, that's when we did a brief and then made the attempt. I know you can't remember the person's name. Do you remember the street he lived on? I'd have to see the map. I just don't remember the street offhand. Okay. I know it was near Morse Road. I do, it was kind of off of Morse Road. Did you attempt to execute the warrant at this second add-on? Yes, we did. We where, where in the day sorry. did you attempt to execute that warrant? Do you remember? Late morning, early afternoon, somewhere in there. I don't remember the exact time. Um, I know it was lunchtime because I was hungry. Was the person home? No, ultimately it was not. We made the attempt, interviewed the mother of the that fugitive. She gave us consent, let us check the whole house. So we, we did all that, uh, made sure the house was safe while I was doing the interview. I collected all the information. <clears throat> and then ultimately, um, you know, since Jay was the full-time TFO, it came from Franklin County, it was Jay's case. So I took the notes that I had and gave them to Jay so he could type up what's called the USM 11, which is our report for the Marshal Service. And USM stands for? United States Marshal. Now, it sounds like your stomach was talking to you at this point, uh, Deputy Elvis. What'd you do? So once we got done with that case, I think it was Kendall Barber was his name, but I'm not, I just, I would need to see the report to refresh my memory. But once we got done with that case, uh, we just did a quick debrief. I made sure J Jay had all my notes so he could be able to type that 11 up later that day. And then I called it for the day for us. Um, told everybody, get food get where you need to be, but keep in mind, the early, first add-on we had for the uh, rapist, raper out of Delaware County, when we did finally make that attempt, it was prior to the Barber case, he wasn't home and I was waiting for him to get home. So I told everybody we're gonna be done, but there's gonna be a call out later when this guy gets home and I'm gonna need all hands on deck for him because he was supposed to have a gun on his person. So then everybody started leaving. Um, I had a TFO riding with me, a part-time TFO, and we went to the Wendy's off of Morse Road. It was just quick, it was easy. Grab food, head back to the office, do paperwork with my plan, and then wait for the phone call when the uh, Delaware case was gonna get home. Anything unusual happen while you're at Wendy's? <clears throat> yeah, as, just as I got to the drive through to order, uh, I, I always keep my radio on, uh, whether it's the radio in my vehicle, my GOV, or my portable radio that's on my vest. I still had my gear on. I don't like taking it off in the neighborhood where we just made an arrest attempt. I like to wait, get out of the neighborhood, stop somewhere more public out of the way, or just wait till I get back to our office and then I'll take my gear off. <clears throat> We're in the drive through line, the TFO Brown and I, and that's when I hear over the earpiece in my ear from my portable radio, Jay come on the air and say, I'm the guy. Excited evidence. Councilman approach.
word. Oh. I'm going to wait this time. <laughs> I'm the one at the poll. All right, you can inquire. Deputy Youngless, uh, who's, without saying what you heard, the content of the communication, whose voice did you hear? Uh, Jamie. And as a result of hearing Jay Mead, what did you do? I immediately, I verified what Jay said. I basically asked him to repeat himself. Um, did he? He did. And then I asked, I'm sorry. What did you do? Uh, ultimately, in this conversation, very, very brief conversation, I realized it was not our fugitive that we were just at, Kendall Barber but we needed to respond back to the same street, um, the opposite end of it. And uh, at that point, I radioed on my radio, if anyone still hears this, get back, get back to where we were just at. Jay needs help. Did other people respond? Yeah, multiple. And without saying what they responded, did other people respond to your communication? Yes, multiple TFOs uh, responded offhand Seven, including myself, I believe it was, responded. And you're at Wendy's in the drive-thru, so what do you do as a result of uh, the communication? I activate my lights and sirens in my GOV, get out to Morse Road. Uh, the address was already, for, for Mr. Barber's uh, warrant attempt, that address was still in my GPS, so I just hit that real quick to get me back into the, onto the street that we needed to be on. <clears throat> How long and does it take you to get back there? Seemed like it took forever. Um, it was just a matter of minutes. Morse Road, uh, for those not familiar, near 71, is horrible throughout the day at any given day, so it was very busy with traffic. But with my lights and sirens, I ultimately made it there in just a few minutes. Based on the communication, did you view this as a serious situation? Uh, absolutely. I uh, viewed this as uh, one of my guys is in need of help with something that was exigent and violent and that could cause the harm to him or someone else. That's the second time you've used this word exigent. What does that mean? <clears throat> exigent is something, a good example would be an active shooter. Um, that's an exigent circumstance. Um, back in the day when I first started into my training as law enforcement, things you, you used to as a cop, you wouldn't respond to something exigent like that right away. Just you wanted to have all your people there. But now that, that has changed. When it's an exigent circumstance, we are to respond and as safely and as um, fast as we can to handle the threat of that exigence. So once you pushed through the traffic uh, of Morris Road, uh, did you see Jason Mead when you, res you responded to the stage plate? Uh, as I got on the road, I saw his GOV down the street. Uh, driver's side door was open, and it was at an angle, if you will, in front of a house. Um, so I got there myself, and TFO Brown got out of my vehicle. I cannot remember if I saw Jay immediately, uh, but I, it was either immediately or right after we ended up clearing that house, I spoke with Jay. Um, but but I want to say I think I saw him immediately, and I've never seen Jay's demeanor be what I saw that day. How so? Uh, Jay is the type of guy, whenever we, he was always my rifle guy. Whenever I assign someone to a shield, which is every house we hit, I always have someone with a rifle right up next to that shield. That's the cover for that rifle, correction, the cover for that shield, because sometimes when you're on the shield, you may not be able to have your pistol out. Uh, as more as your offense, if you will, if shots were to be fired. So some, that's why the rifle is there. It's the guy to protect the shield hair, uh, bearer in the event things went south. Jay being a Franklin County SWAT member um, and all the other Franklin County SWAT members we've had on that I've uh, been able to work with, they're very good with their firearms. So I wanted Jay on that rifle. Um, Jay would always be the guy that wants to be in there to help protect his team. Jay's very good at that. I've been in uses of force and seen how he responds in every one of them, so I knew Jay is a good guy to have on the rifle and be there ready to go in. This time, uh, when I saw him, he just had a blank stare on his face, like, like he just saw a ghost, and that shocked me because I've never seen that kind of a look on Jay's face before. Um, and I asked him two questions, and I forget the order in which I asked him, 
but I did ask him, are you okay? And he nodded yes. And I asked him, did you pull your trigger? And he nodded yes. And he just had this shocked blank stare on his face. So I knew something obviously was wrong by seeing his face without even knowing he pulled the trigger at that time. So what's your primary responsibility as a team leader once you get to 3996 and state's place? My primary responsibility at that point, um, I also saw TFO Rosser, who was a full-time TFO, his vehicle there. I knew him and TFO Yorkowitz uh, rode together that day. Once I got done with Jay, I looked and I saw a thigh rig uh, laying on the sidewalk, if you will, leading up to the back door or the, uh, basically it's, it's a belt with a bunch of, it could have magazines on it, could have uh, your baton on it, your OC, your firearms attached to it, things like that. It just goes around your waist and sometimes it will, the, the gun holster can uh, be attached to your thigh, that's for the term thigh rig. But I saw that laying on the ground and I knew immediately that belonged to TFO Rosser. So my, now my thought is I have guys potentially in a house not knowing their status. I see a thigh rig laying on the ground that I've ne doesn't happen. Um, I don't know how many guys are in this house. I don't know if any threats are in this house whatsoever. I'm blind going into this until I get all, see where all my guys are at. And did you eventually clear the house? Yeah, ultimately we got there. Uh, TFOs, Hawkins, and Gordon also arrived. I had TFO Hawkins stay out in the front yard uh, as, as perimeter, if you will. As I got to the door with TFO Brown and I believe TFO Gordon initially was out front too in the front yard. As I get to the, the side door with TFO Brown, I see TFO Barnhart uh, performing life-saving measures on an individual. I have no idea who that is at the time. I see as you walk into the house, there's the kitchen entrance um, from that particular door. To the left is a hallway. Immediately there's a closed door that leads to the basement, I assumed. TFO Yorkowich is standing just shy of that door because it's an unknown threat at this time, what's potentially in that, uh, down that basement. So he doesn't want to stand in front of that door to keep himself safe. But he's m watching that hallway, which ultimately leads into the living room. In the event there was a threat that were to come out through that way into the kitchen. Part of TFO Yorkowich's um, responsibility as he's guarding that hallway is address any threats that may come, and also protect TFO Barnhart, who is performing life-saving measures at this point. Just past TFO Barnhart, um, there's TFO Rosser. I see he has his vest on. He has his gun in his hand, because I, I noticed his gun wasn't in his thigh rig when I saw it on the sidewalk. His vest isn't even on, his tactical vest that has the rifle plates and ballistic uh, uh, soft armor in it wasn't even fully attached. He didn't quite have it on. He just had it on enough to have it on. He's guarding another hallway, which I believe led to bedrooms, but I didn't know for sure at that point in time, performing the same role as TFO Yorkowitz, protecting TFO Barnhart from any potential threats that may come from that hallway as he's performing life-saving measures. Um, I also seen on the floor a pistol laying right next to uh, TFO Barnhart and the suspect on the floor. So when you clear a house, does that essentially mean you get everyone out of the house? Yes, when we clear a house, we go room to room, top to bottom, basement to however many floors there are to make sure the house is safe. There are no more threats that we saw or, or have found in there. Sometimes we do a secondary sweep. Just depends upon the, how big the house is, if we found our fugitive yet or not. So we get there. we. I decide we're going to go through where TFO Yorkowitz is. We have uh, one of the guys hold that basement door as we push past it. It's closed. There's no reason to go through a closed door at this point when beyond it is an open room that I don't know what's in that room. Uh, I come across a lot of people in there. I couldn't tell you the number of people. Ultimately order everyone out the front door. They had a dog. The dog went out. Right before they went out the front door, I radioed to TFO Hawkins, sending you know, people out the front door. We get everybody out there. Hawkins is basically detaining all of them at that point. No one's under arrest. I don't know what all has happened at this point. My primary concern is to make this house safe so we can, while we're waiting on the squad to come and, and TFO Barnhart can uh, safely perform the life-saving measures he's doing. Did you accomplish making the house safe? Ultimately, yes, we cleared the house, got everyone out, um, made the house uh, safe and secure, basement included, 
Uh, at one point through that, TFO Hawkins radioed, it's, it's cold out here, can we get these people in a car? And I said, absolutely, get them in a car. Let's let them keep as warm as we could based on the weather conditions that day. What happened to the Delaware warrant that night? Later that night, oh goodness. Yeah, I'm going to object. That's not really overruled. Later that night, I ultimately got the phone call that that fugitive came back and was at home. And so I, based on the events uh, that happened that day, I didn't have the manpower to, to go out and arrest this uh, Delaware guy with the rapist, but I have an obligation to do this at this point. Fortunately, I was able to get CPD SWAT on board, met with them, briefed, gave them everything they needed, and they assisted with that. We went and effected that arrest, and upon entry, he shot himself. Sounds like you have a dangerous job, Deputy Angus. It's a very dangerous day. Thank you, sir. Thanks, sir. <clears throat> Any uh, cross-examination? Oh. Thank you. <clears throat> Morning, sir. A GOV is a government owned vehicle? Yes, sir. Okay. Just just wanted to make sure. <clears throat> um, now, in, in your testimony, early on in your testimony, you talked about uh, deadly force <clears throat> and Someone with a shovel, you, you shoot somebody with a shovel? If they are going to approach it and pick it up as in a swinging fashion, like they're chopping with an axe, that's absolute deadly force. All right. I just wanted to clarify because you yes, said sir. if they pick up a shovel, then then it's deadly force and you shoot them. No. I, yeah, so people can carry shovels and not get shot. They absolutely can. But when you raise it as in a chopping motion, that's now considered deadly force. Um, now... You, you went through how, how you all operate, and you, you spend a lot of time planning out what's going to happen. Isn't that correct? Yes, sir. And, and I think you, you said you have a morning briefing, you put together a packet, uh, and then even after all that, you, when, when you go to wherever the site is that you're going to execute a warrant, uh, you meet again and, and, and consult with one another, consult with your team, you line up different duties for your team. Um, you, don't, you don't go off by yourself, is that correct? What do you mean by go off by ourselves? You don't just go up at the, at, at the, the, the place you're you're looking for the fugitive and, and head in without planning who's going to do what, do you? Correct. We, for every case that we have a FID for, again, we don't work a case without a FID. Every case that we have a FID for, that means we have a, a valid arrest warrant that we're attempting to affect. So we brief every case the same way to include even if one of us gets hurt, Here's the evac vehicle. This is the level one trauma hospital we're going to use. So for every FID case that we have, we absolutely brief it ahead of time. If it needs a debrief after, meaning someone had a question of why I did this, or I have to question of, well, why did you do this? We, we discuss that before we go to the next case. Then we find another meet location near where we're going to go. We brief up the next case. Sometimes we do one case in a day. It just depends on the events of that case. Sometimes it's only one case because it's that big of a priority to us. A lot of times, though, we're running three, four, five, six, seven cases a day. It just there's no stop time to this type of work. But 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 the point is, Deputy Youngless, you act as a team. Isn't that correct? Unless it's exigent, yes, sir. Well, even if it's exigent, if you have other team members present, you consult with them. You, you, you act together. Isn't that correct? Uh, if it's exigent, there's not a whole lot of time to do an ops plan to get someone uh, into our capture. If it's exigent, you have to respond as best and safely as you can right then. So, so, so you bypass your team members? 
not necessarily. It depends on the situation. It de depends on the reason for the exigency. Well, and, and, in, and, and in fact, if your team member is in a vehicle right behind you and you stop and, and, and consult with him, you don't then leave him behind, do you? Who, who, I guess, who was in the vehicle I'm, behind me? I'm asking the questions. I, I'm, okay. Can I you just, clarify I, your I, question, I, I, sir? Don't speak I'm over each other. I'm, I'm sorry. I'm trying to clarify, Your Honor. I'm asking you, in, in a situation where your team members are present, you do not go off on your own and, and, uh, and try to effectuate an arrest. Isn't that correct? It depends on the exigency of the situation, sir. There are different levels of reasons for something to be considered exigent in a law enforcement officer's mind. in order to talk to you about shooting center mass. Yes, sir. And, and that, you know, you explained that that's the easiest thing to hit. Yes, sir. And, and the easiest thing to incapacitate. Isn't that correct? To stop the threat, yes, sir. Well, you're using stop the threat. Incapacitate, that's stopping the threat, isn't it? I'm trained to stop the threat, sir. You, you can use whatever verbiage you'd like to use for it, but I'm always going to say we're trained to stop the threat, sir. We're trained to hit center mass. You're trained to hit center mass, which is the easiest to hit, and where the most vital organs are, it's going to do the most damage. Correct? It could, yes. The most likely place to cause death. A headshot will cause death almost upon impact, but it's is it's it most likely. Don't hit? talk over. Don't I'm talk sorry. over. Is it as easy to hit as center mass? I've said earlier, center mass is where we're trying to shoot because it's the biggest body part. Okay. <clears throat> um, now, now you discussed once you got to the location what you did with your team. Um, other officers responded, isn't that correct, from other agencies? Yeah, typically uh, TFO Rosser is good because his our marshal channels are on his CPD, Columbus Police Department radio. Typically, uh, in many past times, whether we've had someone barricaded or uh, someone that has shot at us and we needed, whether it's CPD SWAT or Franklin County SWAT or Ohio State P Patrol, uh, SRT, the Special Response Team, whatever SWAT team uh, or term, however you want to term them, response, TO4 roster is usually really good at switching his radio over to the CPT dispatch channel and immediately calling uh, for help to get additional units out there. Did you get there before any CPD officer? I believe I did. I'm not positive, but I believe I did. I don't recall seeing any local uh, officers there at that time, but I, I just don't remember offhand. Okay. Um, <clears throat> did you, you didn't immediately enter the house, did you? No, I had to assess what I had uh, going on out there outside of the house. Um, and then I saw TFOs Barnhart, Yorkowitz, and Rosser inside the house at that point is when I knew we had to make entry and find out what I had going on in there. And, 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 when, at the point you made entry, there were CPD officers, uh, other officers from other agencies that were on the site. Isn't that correct? I don't know offhand when they arrived, sir. That wasn't my focus of wondering when they're going to arrive. My focus was everything I mentioned earlier. And I knew I had, myself included, seven team members there that I could do the job I needed to at hand, which was to make that residence safe. And, and, and initially... Mr. Meade 
assisted you with with clearing the house isn't that correct uh, he did not I don't he, believe he, he did. did not wander through the house he did not direct people out if he did I don't know that because when I saw him I believe it was at his GOV was that his at his vehicle yeah his and his he remained there I'm sorry and he remained there as far as I know I don't know if he did or not I once I spoke to him found out what had happened my focus again was making that house safe so life-saving measures could be performed I don't know exactly where he went or if any other locals when they showed up you, you described this blank look on his face and, and, and so forth I want to play a video for you and see if this captures the look that you were describing <clears throat> your screen work it's says what the big screen there does sir what? mine does that. No, that was the front porch. I don't know what happened at the front porch. I'm talking about Mr. Mr. Mead's demeanor. Is that the demeanor that, that you observed? No, it was not. Do you know at what point that video is? I have no idea. This is the first I've seen that or even know anything about anything on the front porch, sir. Right at the outset of the video, isn't that uh, TFO Yorkowitz standing in the doorway? Correct. That's him. Okay, so, so he has apparently moved across the living room at that point. He assisted in clearing the house. TFO Yorkowitz did. Right. But he's standing. He's standing in the in the front doorway. There. If he's standing in the doorway, it's I'm guessing it's because the house has already been deemed clear at that point, and we would have aired that on the radio. Okay. But that's not the demeanor that, that you observed of Mr. Me. No, it was not. Looks like he got better. That's not my decision to make. Thank you. Deputy Redirect. Deputy Youngless, um, do exigent circumstances and exigent situation, do those uh, afford you the luxury of planning? They do not. Uh, when, when exigent circumstances arrive, every law enforcement officer, even I can say this even when I was a local officer, you have to decide at that point in time your risks versus what's happening at that point in time the risk not only to yourselves but is this something you can do immediately is this something you have to wait and try to plan a 10 or 15 minute brief on or what the situation is if it's exigent your answer is already there you cannot wait to have that lengthy brief and try to figure out all your possible solutions to affecting any arrest you testified also that uh, if someone presents a deadly threat to you that you Target center mass. You remember that? Yes, sir. Stop the threat? Yes, sir. And you said that that's the biggest part of the body. It's the easiest to hit. Is it true that it's the slowest part of the body? It absolutely is. Uh, I could stand up here and do jumping jacks as fast as my body would allow me. And you can see how fast my arms and legs move to include my head. Your center mass is going to be your center mass. It's going to stay where it's at. It's, it's going to be not even close to being as fast as waving your arms or, or kicking your legs or anything like that. Are you familiar with situations, Deputy Youngless, where the center mass of uh, someone was targeted, but yet they did not stop? Uh, absolutely. I've been to a, a, a lot of trainings. I've, I've been fortunate enough 
Um, one of the trainings that I was in, they showed a video, I believe it happened in Cleveland, I don't know the exact year, where multiple cops shot a fugitive or suspect that had his girlfriend had a gunpoint, held at gunpoint, and multiple rounds. Um, one of the additional trainings I've been to, I've been to two through the Marshal Service, Overruled. Pretty far afield. Overruled. One of the two, two major trainings that the Marshal Service puts on uh, that I'm very thankful for, it's called HRFA, H-R-F-P-A, high, I'm sorry, H-R-F, H-E, H-R-F-A, excuse me, high risk fugitive apprehension. Every deputy U.S. Marshal has to go through HRFA 1 and then there's a HRFA 2. Uh, during my HRFA, one training, they just went through various scenarios, uh, entry, things like that. My HERFA 2 training that I went to was actually back at Fletzy for a, a whole other week. And they brought in a deputy U.S. marshal uh, that had uh, experience in a shooting. To, he was willing to speak about what happened in his mind, what happened in his shooting. Um, this deputy, uh, as he was explaining what happened, there was a fugitive that the task force was there to make an arrest on. Uh, this deputy was on rear, was on containment. I don't remember if it was front or rear containment, but he has uh, his rifle, his AR uh, style rifle. Ultimately, the fugitive was able to get away from inside the house with a firearm and shot at this deputy, striking the deputy. This deputy U.S. Marshal fired his AR a total of 21 times at the fugitive. 20 of those shots were center mass with this rifle and it did not stop the fugitive, he kept coming. It was almost to a point blank range where the deputy shot that fugitive uh, in the head with his AR that stopped that threat. So that's, it took 21 shots with an AR for that fugitive to that threat to be stopped uh, before that deputy could get, get himself to the hospital or, or have his teammates get him to the hospital. So an AR is an AR-15? Yes, sir. And that's a high velocity round? Very high velocity. Thank you. Any questions as a result of those? <clears throat> that's, that's an unusual situation. It's not for me to decide what's unusual or not when it comes to stopping a threat, sir. Gotcha. That, the, the, yeah. Well, the, the one that you just described, mo most people don't get shot 21 times and keep coming. Uh, if you remember my earlier testimony, I said it all depends on the fight and the person, how much fight you have, how much you can take until you can't take it anymore. Um, and, and when you talk about an exigent circumstance, it could be an active shooter, and that's where you said you, you charge in. It depends upon the situation, <clears throat> the amount of civilians that are affected, the type of building it is. Um, Deputy Young, active shooter means somebody's shooting, doesn't it? Correct. Thank you. All right, you can step down and take all your stuff, so. <coughs> Thank you, sir. All right. Council want to approach? We're going to take a early lunch. Uh, do not discuss this case among yourselves. Do not permit anyone to discuss it with you or in your presence. It is your duty not to form or express an opinion on the case until it is finally submitted to you. Have a good lunch. All rise.
going to be back at about 1.15. We're going to start at 1.30. Uh, the, on the camera, 